The Dummy That Lived by L. Frank Baum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samantha Miles. In all Fairyland, there is no more mischievous a person than Tanko Mankey, the Yellow Rill. He flew through the city one afternoon, quite invisible to moral eyes, but seeing everything himself, and noticed a figure of a wax lady standing behind the big plate glass window of Mr. Floman's department store. The wax lady was beautifully dressed, and extended in her stiff left hand was a card bearing the words, Rare Bargain! This stylish costume, imported from Paris, former price twenty dollars, reduced to only nineteen ninety eight. This impressive announcement had drawn before the window a crowd of women shoppers who stood looking at the wax lady with critical eyes. Tanko Menke laughed to himself the low, gurgling little laugh that always means mischief. Then he flew close to the wax figure and breathed twice upon its forehead. From that instant the dummy began to live, but so dazed and astonished was she at the unexpected sensation that she continued to stand stupidly staring at the women outside and holding out the placard as before. Anyone but Tanko Menke would have remained to help the wax lady out of the troubles that were sure to overtake her, but this naughty elf thought it rare fun to turn the inexperienced lady loose in a cold and heartless world and leave her to shift for herself. Fortunately, it was almost six o'clock when the dummy first realized that she was alive, and before she had collected her new thoughts and decided what to do, a man came around and drew down all the window shades, shutting off the view from the curious shoppers. Then the clerks and cashiers and floor walkers and cash girls went home and the store was closed for the night, although the sweepers and scrubbers remained to clean the floors for the following day. The window inhabited by the wax lady was boxed in, like a little room, one small door being left at the side for the window trimmer to creep in and out of. So the scrubbers never noticed that the dummy, when left to herself, dropped the placard to the floor and sat down upon a pile of silks to wonder who she was, where she was, and how she happened to be alive. For you must consider, dear reader, that in spite of her size and her rich costume, in spite of her pink cheeks and fluffy yellow hair, this lady was very young, no older, in reality, than a baby born but half an hour. All she knew of the world was contained in the glimpse she had secured of the busy street facing her window. All she knew of people lay in the actions of the group of women which had stood before her on the other side of the window-pane and criticized the fit of her dress, or remarked upon its stylish appearance. So she had little enough to think about, and her thoughts moved somewhat slowly, yet one thing she really decided upon, and that was not to remain in the window and be insolently stared at by a lot of women who were not nearly so handsome or well-dressed as herself. By the time she reached this important conclusion, it was after midnight, but dim lights were burning in the big deserted store, so she crept through the door of her window and walked down the long aisles, pausing now and then to look with much curiosity at the wealth of finery confronting her on every side. When she came to the glass cases filled with trimmed hats, she remembered having seen upon the heads of the women in the street similar creations. So she selected one that suited her fancy, and placed it carefully upon her yellow locks. I won't attempt to explain what instinct it was that made her glance into a nearby mirror to see if the hat was straight, but this she certainly did. It didn't correspond with her dress very well, but the poor thing was too young to have much taste in matching colors. When she reached the glove counter, she remembered that gloves were also worn by the women she had seen. She took a pair from the case and tried to fit them upon her stiff, wax-coated fingers, but the gloves were too small and ripped in the seams. Then she tried another pair, and several others as well, but hours passed before she finally succeeded in getting her hands covered with a pair of pea-green kids. Next, 
she selected a parasol from a large and varied assortment in the rear of the store. Not that she had any idea what it was used for, but other ladies carried such things, so she also would have one. When she again examined herself critically in the mirror, she decided her outfit was now complete, and to her inexperienced eyes there was no perceptible difference between her and the women who had stood outside the window. Whereupon she tried to leave the store, but found every door fast locked. The wax lady was in no hurry. She inherited patience from her previous existence. Just to be alive and to wear beautiful clothes was sufficient enjoyment for her at present. So she sat down upon a stool and waited quietly until daylight. When the janitor unlocked the door in the morning, the wax lady swept past him and walked with stiff but stately strides down the street. The poor fellow was so completely wuckered at seeing the well-known wax lady leave her window and march away from the store that he fell over in a heap and only saved himself from fainting by striking his funny bone against the doorstep. When he recovered his wits, she had turned the corner and disappeared. The wax lady's immature mind had reasoned that, since she had come to life, her evident duty was to mix with the world and do whatever other folks did. She could not realize how different she was from people of flesh and blood, nor did she know she was the first dummy that had ever lived, or that she owed her unique experience to Tanko Mankey's love of mischief. So ignorance gave her a confidence in herself that she was not justly entitled to. It was yet early in the day, and the few people she met were hurrying along the streets. Many of them turned into restaurants and eating houses, and following their example, the wax lady also entered one and sat upon a stool before a lunch counter. "'Coffee and rolls,' said a shop girl on the next stool. "'Coffee and rolls,' repeated the dummy, and soon the waiter placed them before her. Of course she had no appetite, as her constitution, being mostly wood, did not require food, but she watched the shop girl and saw her put the coffee to her mouth and drink it. Therefore the wax lady did the same and the next instant was surprised to feel the hot liquid trickling out between her wooden ribs. The coffee also blistered her wax lips, and so disagreeable was the experience that she arose and left the restaurant, paying no attention to the demands of the waiter for twenty cents, mum. Not that she intended to defraud him, but the poor creature had no idea what he meant by twenty cents, mum. As she came out, she met the window trimmer at Blowman's store. The man was rather near-sighted, but seeing something familiar in the lady's features, he politely raised his hat. The wax lady also raised her hat, thinking it the proper thing to do, and the man hurried away with a horrified face. Then a woman touched her arm and said, "'Beg pardon, ma'am, but there's a price mark hanging on your dress behind.' "'Yes, I know,' replied the wax lady stiffly. "'It was originally twenty dollars, but it's been reduced to nineteen ninety-eight. The woman looked surprised at such indifference and walked on. Some carriages were standing at the edge of the sidewalk, and seeing the dummy hesitate, a driver approached her and touched his cap. "'Cab, ma'am?' he asked. "'No,' said she, misunderstanding him. "'I'm wax.' "'Oh!' he exclaimed, and looked after her wonderingly. "'Here's your morning paper,' yelled a newsboy. "'Mine, did you say?' she asked. "'Sure. Chronicle, Choir, Republican Spatch. What'll he have?' "'What are they for?' inquired the wax lady simply. "'Why, to read, of course. All the news, you know.' She shook her head and glanced at a paper. "'Looks all speckled and mixed up,' she said. "'I'm afraid I can't read.' "'Ever been to school?' asked the boy, becoming interested. "'No. What school?' she inquired. The boy gave her an indignant look. Say, he cried, you're just a dummy, that's what ye are, and ran away to seek a more promising customer. I wonder what he means, thought the poor lady. Am I really different in some way from all the others? I look like them, certainly, and I try to act like them, yet that boy called me a dummy and seemed to think I acted queerly. The idea worried her a little, but she walked on to the corner, where she noticed a street car stop to let some people on. The wax lady, still determined to do as others did, also boarded the car and sat down quietly in a corner. After riding a few blocks, the conductor approached her and said, "'Fair, please.' "'What's that?' 
she inquired innocently. "'You're fair,' said the man impatiently. She stared at him stupidly, trying to think what he meant. "'Come, come,' growled the conductor. "'Either pay up or get off.' Still she did not understand, and he grabbed her rudely by the arm and lifted her to her feet. But when his hand came in contact with the hard wood of which her arm was made, the fellow was filled with surprise. He stooped down and peered into her face, and, seeing it was wax instead of flesh, he gave a yell of fear and jumped from the car, running as if he had seen a ghost. At this the other passengers also yelled and sprang from the car, fearing a collision, and the motorman, knowing something was wrong, followed suit. The wax lady, seeing the others run, jumped from the car last of all, and stepped in front of another car coming at full speed from the opposite direction. She heard cries of fear and of warning on all sides, but before she understood her danger she was knocked down and dragged for half a block. When the car was brought to a stop a policeman reached down and pulled her from under the wheels. Her dress was badly torn and soiled. Her left ear was entirely gone, and the left side of her head was caved in, but she quickly scrambled to her feet and asked for her hat. This a gentleman had already picked up, and when the policeman handed it to her and noticed the great hole in her head and the hollow place it disclosed, the poor fellow trembled so frightfully that his knees actually knocked together. "'Why, ma'am, you're killed!' he gasped. "'What does it mean to be killed?' asked the wax lady. The policeman shuddered and wiped the perspiration from his forehead. "'You're it!' he answered with a groan. The crowd that had collected were looking upon the lady wonderingly, and a middle-aged gentleman now exclaimed, "'Why, she's wax!' "'Wax!' echoed the policeman. "'Certainly. She's one of those dummies they put in the windows,' declared the middle-aged man. The people who had collected shouted, "'You're right!' "'That's what she is. She's a dummy.' "'Are you?' inquired the policeman sternly. The wax lady did not reply. She began to fear she was getting into trouble, and the staring crowd seemed to embarrass her. Suddenly a boot-black attempted to solve the problem by saying, "'You guys is all wrong. Can a dummy talk? Can a dummy walk? Can a dummy live?' "'Hush!' murmured the policeman. "'Look here!' and he pointed to the hole in the lady's head. The newsboy looked, turned pale, and whistled to keep himself from shivering. A second policeman now arrived, and after a brief conference it was decided to take the strange creature to headquarters. So they called a hurry-up wagon, and the damaged wax lady was helped inside and driven to the police station. There the policeman locked her in a cell and hastened to tell Inspector Mugg their wonderful story. Inspector Mugg had just eaten a poor breakfast and was not in a pleasant mood, so he roared and stormed at the unlucky policemen, saying they were themselves dummies to bring such a fairy tale to a man of sense. He also hinted that they had been guilty of intemperance. The policemen tried to explain, but Inspector Mugg would not listen, and while they were still disputing in rushed Mr. Floman, the owner of the department store. "'I want a dozen detectives at once, Inspector!' he cried. "'What for?' demanded Mug. "'One of the wax ladies has escaped from my store "'and eloped with a 1998 costume, a 423 hat, "'a 219 parasol, and a 76-cent pair of gloves, "'and I want her arrested.' "'While he paused for breath, the inspector glared at him in amazement. "'Is everybody going crazy at the same time?' he inquired sarcastically. "'How could a wax dummy run away?' "'I don't know what she did. "'When my janitor opened the door this morning, "'he saw her run out.' "'Why didn't he stop her?' asked Mug. "'He was too frightened, "'but she's stolen my property, Your Honor, "'and I want her arrested,' declared the storekeeper. "'The inspector thought for a moment. "'He wouldn't be able to prosecute her,' he said, "'for there's no law against dummy stealing.' "'Mr. Floman sighed bitterly. Am I to lose that 1998 costume and the 425 hat and— By no means, interrupted Inspector Mugg. The police of this city are ever prompt to act in defense of our worthy citizens. We have already arrested the wax lady, and she is locked up in cell number 16. You may go there and recover your property, if you wish, but before you prosecute her for stealing, you'd better hunt up a law that applies to dummies. 
all i want said mr flowman is that nineteen ninety eight costume and come along interrupted the policeman i'll take you to the cell but when they entered number sixteen they found only a lifeless dummy lying prone upon the floor its wax was cracked and blistered its head was badly damaged and the bargain costume was dusty soiled and much bedraggled for the mischief-loving tanko Mankey had flown by and breathed once more upon the poor wax lady and in that instant her brief life ended it's just as i thought said inspector mugg leaning back in his chair contentedly i knew all the time the thing was a fake seems sometimes as though the whole world would go crazy if there wasn't some level-headed man around to bring em to their senses dummies are wooden wax and that's all there is of em that may be the rule whispered the policeman to himself but this one were a dummy as lived end of the dummy that lived by l frank baum recording by samantha miles Poor Little Doll by Miss W. K. Clifford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ethel Bus. It was a plain little doll that had been bought for sixpence at a stall in the marketplace. It had scanty hair and a weak composition face a calico body and a foolish feet that always turn inwards instead of outwards and from which the sawdust now and then was yet in its glass eyes there was an expression of amusement they seemed to be looking not at you but through you and the pursed up red lips were always smiling at what the glass eyes saw well you were a doll the boy said looking up from his french exercise and what are you staring at me for is there anything behind he asked looking over his shoulder the doll made no answer and whatever are you smiling for he asked i believe you were always smiling i believe we'd go on if i didn't do my exercise till next year or if the cat died or the monument tumbled down but still the doll smiled in silence, and the boy went on with his exercise. Presently he looked up again and yawned. I think I go for a stroll, he said, and put his book by. I know what I will do, he said suddenly. I will take that doll and hang it up to the apple tree to scare away the sparrow. And calling out, sees i have taken your doll i'm going to make a scarecrow of it he went off to the garden his sister rushed after him crying out oh my poor doll oh my dear little doll what are you doing to it you naughty boy it's so ugly he said no it's not ugly she cried and it's so stupid it never does anything but smile it can't ever grow it never gets any bigger poor darling doll she said as she got it once more safely into her arms of course can't grow but it's not your fault they did not make any tucks in you to let it out and it's so unfeeling it went smiling away like anything when i could not do my french it has no heart of course it cannot feel why hasn't it got a heart because it isn't alive you ought to be sorry for it and very very kind to it poor thing well what is it always smiling for because it's so good answered sis bursting in tears it is never bad tempered it never complains and it never did anything unkind and kissing it tenderly you are always good and sweet she said and always look smiling though you must be very unhappy at not being alive 
End of The Poor Little Doll by Miss W. K. Clifford How the Rhinoceros Got His Skin by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, on an uninhabited island on the shores of the Red Sea, there lived a Parsi from whose hat the rays of the sun were reflected in more than oriental splendor. And the Parsi lived by the sea with nothing but his hat and his knife and a cooking stove of the kind that you must particularly never touch. And one day he took flour and water and currants and plums and sugar and things and made himself one cake, which was two feet across and three feet thick. It was indeed a superior comestible, that's magic, and he put it on the stove because he was allowed to cook on the stove and he baked it and he baked it till it was all done brown and smelt most sentimental but just as he was going to eat it there came down from the beach from the altogether uninhabited interior one rhinoceros with a horn on his nose two piggy eyes and few manners in those days the rhinoceros's skin fitted him quite tight there were no wrinkles in it anywhere he looked exactly like a Noah's Ark rhinoceros, but of course much bigger. All the same, he had no manners then, and he has no manners now, and he never will have any manners. He said, How? And the Parsi left that cake and climbed to the top of a palm tree, with nothing on but his hat, from which the rays of the sun were always reflected in more than oriental splendor. And the rhinoceros upset the oil stove with his nose, and the cake rolled on the sand. And he spiked that cake on the horn of his nose, and he ate it, and went away, waving his tail through the desolate and exclusively uninhabited interior, which abuts on the island of Mazandran, Socotra, and Promontories, of the larger equinox. Then the Parsi came down from his palm tree to put the stove on its legs, and recited the following sloka, which, as you have not heard, I will now proceed to relate. Then that takes the cakes, which the Parsi man bakes, makes dreadful mistakes. And there was a great deal more in that than you would think, because five weeks later there was a heat wave in the Red Sea, and everybody took off all the clothes they had. The Parsi took off his hat, but the rhinoceros took off his skin and carried it over his shoulder as he came down to the beach to bathe. In those days, it buttoned underneath with three buttons and looked like a waterproof. He said nothing whatever about the Parsi's cake because he had eaten it all. And he never had any manners then, since, or henceforth. He waddled straight into the water and blew bubbles through his nose, leaving his skin on the beach. Presently, the Parsi came by and found the skin, and he smiled one smile that ran all round his face two times. Then he danced three times round the skin and rubbed his hands. Then he went to his camp and filled his hat with cake crumbs, for the Parsi never ate anything but cake, and never swept out his camp. He took that skin, and he shook the skin, and he scrubbed that skin, and he rubbed that skin just as full of old, dry, stale, tickly cake crumbs and some burned currants as ever it could possibly hold. Then he climbed to the top of his palm tree, and waited for the rhinoceros to come out of the water and put it on. And the rhinoceros did. He buttoned it up with the three buttons, and it tickled like cake crumbs in bed. Then he wanted to scratch, but that made it worse, and he lay down on the sand and rolled and rolled. 
and every time he rolled, the cake crumbs tickled him worse and worse. Then he ran to a palm tree and rubbed and rubbed and rubbed himself against it. He rubbed so much and so hard that he rubbed his skin into a great fold over his shoulders and another fold underneath where the buttons used to be, but he rubbed the buttons off. So he rubbed m some more folds over his legs, and it spoiled his temper, but it didn't make the least difference to the cake crumbs. They were inside his skin, and they tickled. So he went home very angry indeed, and horribly scratchy, and from that day to this, every rhinoceros has great folds in his skin and a very bad temper, all on account of the cake crumbs inside. But the Parsi came down from his palm tree wearing his hat, from which the rays of the sun were reflected in more than oriental splendor, packed up his cooking stove and went away in the direction of Oratevo, Amygdala, the upland meadows of Anatarvio, and the marshes of Sonaput. This uninhabited island is off Cape Gardafui by the beaches of Socotra and Pink Arabian Sea. It's hot too hot from Suez for the likes of you and me ever to go in a P and O and call on the cake parsley. End of the How the Rhinoceros Got His Skin by Rudyard Kipling Read by Francis Brown
The Strange Little Girl, a story for children by V. M. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1. Once upon a time there was a beautiful palace where the king's children lived as happily as they alone can live. They never wanted anything, and they never knew that there could be others who were not as happy as they. Sometimes it is true they would hear a story which would make them almost think that perhaps there was a world beyond, which they did not know, outside the palace of a king and its gardens. But something would seem to say that after all it was only a fairy story, and they would forget that it meant anything that might really be true. One of the little princesses seemed to think more of these stories of a world beyond the palace garden than the others, and she would sometimes find herself gazing at the sun, and wondering if the great world lay beyond the purple forests where the golden-edged clouds shone like dark mountains in the distance. And the name of this princess was Aileen. More and more as she thought of these things, she felt sure that there must be a world where things were very different from the happy life in the palace garden. And in the stories which the children heard, she thought of many things, which with the others she used to pass by without notice. Once they used to hear of no sorrow, no pain, but only joy and peace. Now, in thinking, she sometimes noticed that there were things which were not spoken, that there were things passed by in silence, that there were things which travelers passing through the palace kept back, as though they knew of much which the children must not know, and yet which they would have told had they dared. Questions Aileen asked, and the answers seldom satisfied her, for they never seemed to tell her everything. Every time one of the travelers left the palace to return on his journey, there seemed to be a look of appeal in his eyes, an appeal which only Aileen seemed to see, and which made her wish to follow them for the very love that shone in the kind faces of these strangers, strangers who told the children stories of things they loved, of wonderful fairy worlds where they were not as in the palace, of worlds where Aileen seemed to have traveled many times, long, long ago. One day she asked her father, the king, Shall I never go out of the palace, never leave the garden of delight and see the world that lies beyond the cloud mountains, beyond the sunset and the whispering forests? And the king looked intently at Aileen. These are strange fancies, he said. Are you not happy here in the garden? Yes, I am happy, she said, happier than I can tell. But you have not answered me. Is there not a world beyond? Shall I ever see it? Some traveler must have been telling you forbidden tales, said the king. These things I have said may not be spoken in my garden. No traveler has told me, said Aileen. I have seen them looking as though they would tell me, but could not, of things beyond the garden, beyond the palace. I have asked them, and they told me nothing. Yet I have felt that I long to go with them. I have felt that I remember strange places, strange sights, things I know not hear when they speak. Sometimes even it seems that I hear a voice like my own repeating a promise, a promise unfulfilled that must be kept. I will return, I will, I will, it says and I hear voices calling in the wind, in the rustling of the leaves, and in the silence of the day. Come back, come back. And the birds say, Come. The pines whisper to me strange things, and the laughing water in the brooks says, Come. What does it mean? I cannot tell you here, said the king. But why do you wish to leave the palace? You are yet young, and there are many, many years of happiness before you. You may stay in the palace where all things are good, and put these things out of your mind. There is another world, but not for you, yet. Aileen was troubled, or would have been, had such a thing been possible in the palace of the king. May I ever see that land? May I ever leave the palace? 
The children of the king are free to come and go, he said. I may not keep them if they will not stay, for I know that they will come again. 2. Again a traveler came to the palace. He brought with him a harp of seven strings, on which he played to the children. He sang to them for a while, and then for a space was silent. Aileen listened to the strange, beautiful music, and to her it seemed that there was speech in the harp, that it spoke. The other children seemed to listen to the music, but to them it did not seem to speak. To Aileen there were echoes of wonderful things the palace knew not, things that the language of the king could not tell. The harp spoke in a way that the princess Aileen knew and understood, although there were no words in its tones. There were sad and sorrowful notes that told of sorrows the palace never knew. There were strains of music that sounded harsh to the listening ear, though to the careless they told of happiness alone. And as she listened, Aileen dreamed. Clearer and more clear, she felt that the harp told of a world of men where sorrow and sadness and strife were not unknown, where joy should be and was not, where the people groped their way through darkness and thought it light. Return, return, called the harp. And a mighty resolve came to Aileen. I will return, I will, I will. She remembered the king's saying, The children of the king are free to come and go, he had said. I may not keep them if they will not stay, he had told her. She loved him much, but the call came clear, and she dared not seek him to say farewell, lest she should be persuaded to remain. She bowed her head, and to the harper spoke. I will go, she said. I will return with you. Then the harp sent forth such a melody of joyous music that it echoed thrilling through the hot, discordant notes of the world beyond the sunset, and for a moment a chord of harmony ran through the life of men. Joy unto you, men of the underworld! Joy unto you, children of sorrow! Joy unto you, sons of forgetfulness! Joy unto all beings! They passed out of the garden together. THE MUSICIAN AND THE SOUL THREE Westward they travelled, westward, ever westward. The way was dark and sometimes dreary, and Aileen felt like one awakened from a beautiful dream before it was ended. Through the pine forests, over mountains, in deep valleys, and by mighty streams they traveled, for they had the harp to cheer the way, to urge their footsteps onward, for the path was untrodden where they went. There is a path, the harper said, a pleasant path and broad, but the journey is long and we must hasten on our way. To the setting sun, to the gleaming sea we must go, nor may we seek a beaten track lest we be too late. A river there was, in whose waters were reflected pictures of all that surrounded them, such crystal-clear reflections that sometimes it seemed as if they looked at real things in the water, mirrored in the things around them. And on the waters grew beautiful lotus flowers, lilies with cup-shaped leaves. In the blue and white petals of the lotus also there seemed to be reflections, so clear were they. The musician plucked one of the cup-like lily pads and filled it with the water for Eileen. The still surface of the water shone like silver in its green cup as Eileen held it. Then the musician played. Soft and low and sweet were the notes of that wonderful harp. Scarcely they rippled the surface of the water, and yet they vibrated, trembled, spread, until picture after picture came to the surface of the water in colors of every hue. Scarcely may it be told what Aileen saw in the magic cup in the water of remembrance. She seemed to see herself, and yet another, in picture after picture. Now she saw herself as part of a golden sea of selves which made but one self, so lifelike were they, so glorious was their unity. 
Then in life after life Eileen seemed to see her other selves living and loving and working, sleeping and suffering and struggling. She saw that on a day she had made her great resolve to help the world. I will return. I will. I will. And now she knew what things they were she had seemed to remember in the king's garden of delight. Joyously, eagerly, willingly, she saw that she had determined to return to earth in body after body, to help the men of sorrow who struggled and slumbered and suffered. She saw that she had before so done, that her work remained unfinished, to be begun again where she had laid it down. There was suffering shown to her in the cup. There was sorrow and grief and pain. But she saw that it must all be, and was content. For at other times she had desired just such things, that she might know how others felt them, that she might help them the more with understanding. Happiness she had taken to give to others, and she must repay the debt. She saw that all things were just, and when the musician said, in a low voice, Will you yet proceed? I will, she said. Then drink the cup, he said. Drink. She drained the green cup of the lotus leaf until scarcely a drop remained, and with that draught she forgot all things that had been, the garden, the king, the journey and the vision, and the master harper, all were forgotten. Only the remained dim remembrance as of a dream at dawn forgotten. 4. A little ship stood by the shore of the great sea. Into this Aileen entered. There were other ships, some better, some worse, but somehow she knew that just this and not another was the ship she wanted and none questioned her when she entered. So they sailed away towards the setting sun. Long was the voyage and lonely, for the seas ran high and all was dark below in the heart of the ship. Nine months they sailed on the ocean, until in the time appointed land appeared. Strange dwellings were there, domes and spires and crowded cities. With wide, wondering eyes, Aileen watched them as the ship passed them by in strange procession. For the men of that land were like none she knew. None of these things could she remember. For she had forgotten even her name at the river of forgetfulness, where remembrances are left in the mirror of the waters until time and their creator bring them back to life. It seemed as though one of wise and kindly countenance held her as a little child in his arms and whispered softly, Remember, I will return, I will, I will. A light of happy recollection came to her, and she smiled in reply. He had spoken in her own language as the harp had spoken, and strangely, and strangely, strangely she seemed to see in him the harper whose music had told her of the sorrowful land beyond the sunset. For this moment she remembered, and then the thought departed. At first the air seemed heavy and oppressive to the wanderer, but by degrees she grew accustomed to it, and even, in time, scarcely felt it. Yet ever and again a dim remembrance of brighter, purer skies came to her. She spoke of this more than once, but others only laughed and said, The child is dreaming. Because she was no longer dressed in shining garments, they did not know her for the princess she really was. Indeed, she was no way different from those around her, but that at heart, she was still the daughter of the king. They could not see her heart, this they could not know. And seeing that they did not understand, she said no more of the thoughts that came to her. They called it dreaming. But Eileen thought if this were so, a dream were better than waking life, unless... Could these be thoughts that came to her of the world beyond the water, the reflection of the real life? She knew not. We must teach this little dreamer what is life, they said. She will not know what life is if we leave her to her dreams. They made her work and made her play, work that never seemed to do anyone any good, and play that seemed like work. She nearly forgot that, in what they called her dreams, she had ever known of another life. 
Sometimes she sang to herself, strange songs that they said sounded sad and sorrowful, yet of a sweetness all their own. Where does she hear them? people asked. But Eline never told, for the truth was that they came to her in moments when her thoughts were far away, dreaming. She sings like a bird in a cage that knows of a brighter world outside, said one. But he was a poet, so they only smiled as if they themselves would have made the same remark if it had not been so fanciful. And though men thought her sad and lonely, there was joy to her in the hum of the bees and the songs of the birds and the rustling of the leaves. The butterflies and the flowers and the brooks were her friends. What a strange child, people said when they heard her talking to these friends. They did not know of the stories her friends had told her, stories which reminded her of a wonderful garden of delight where men did not ever stare and stare in gaping wonder, because a little child talked with the fairies that live in all things beautiful clothed in robes of sunlight and rainbow hues. They would have taken her away from these friends, but for one old man, her grandfather, who said, The child will be better for the fresh air. Let her live while she may. So it was that she played and talked with the flowers and sang to the brooks and listened to the stories of the forest trees that whispered among themselves. None dared take her away. One day she had been for a long ramble by a mighty river, and the sun had sunk to the westward on its journey. But she turned not to the place she called her home. Tired and worn out with her play, she lay on a rock and slept. In her sleep it seemed that a touch upon her forehead awakened in her a vision of things she had once known, but had now almost forgotten. There was the king's garden and the palace, and the other wonderful buildings, tall and stately, mighty buildings which seemed to speak of mighty builders, noble thoughts and great men's deeds. Some were even more stately, some more humble, than the palace. But in all there was a sense of grander, nobler life than the life those knew who were with her now, and who, laughing, called her a dreamer. And she heard a voice repeating, I will return, I will, I will. Again she smiled as she recognized the voice. A feeling of intense happiness and content came to her, and she awoke. More than ever it seemed as if that other were the real life, and this a heavy dream. 5. The twilight glow still lingered in the west, and the evening breeze called her to thoughts of home. But she had learned wisdom, and when they asked her where she had been, Eline said she had fallen asleep in the sunshine on a rock by the great river, which was true. Of her dream she said nothing to any except to the old man, who alone seemed to understand her a little. He did not laugh but looked with thoughtful eyes, intent, into the distance, away to the starlit sky, and it seemed to her that he was trying to remember a forgotten dream of life. And seeing this, she put her hand in his trustingly, and they too knew well each other's thoughts, though never a word was spoken. It seemed to the old man that the child was leading him along a familiar road to a home forgotten, after many weary days of wandering. There are some things the heart can say that words can never tell, he said to himself when she was gone. I think we understand one another. As time passed by, Eline came to know more and more of that other life, and she longed to tell these things to the people who struggled and surged in hot strife to win the things of the world they knew, never thinking that there was a happier, purer, brighter world. Some thought they knew of such a one, but all except a few made it seem like the one in which they lived. Only they made it a little more bright by day, a little more dark by night, and with a little more success in the strife for the things that change and pass away. These she would tell of the nobler life she knew, but they listened not at all. In due time Aileen was sent to school to learn, but her teachers found little that she did not quickly understand. 
For one thing she remembered now plainly how in the Garden of Delight everything that was done was well done, were it the telling of a story or the singing of a song or the watering of the flowers that grew in that fair land. All was done with a wonderful thoroughness, and Aline now felt that she must do all things in that way or leave them quite alone. But often they would teach Aline things about which she seemed to care little and to understand as one in a dream. Then they would call her attention to the work only to find that she was learning to understand a great deal more than they themselves could tell. It was so with numbers. When they asked her what the numbers were by name, she not only named them all, but told them why they were so named and what each meant. And so with music. With every chord she seemed to see harmonies of color, like beautiful pictures too glorious to paint. And when she said that life itself to her was music, Eline's teachers did not understand. One said, She has learned these things before in another life. Another declared, She sees the heart of things where we see only the outer covering. She sees the soul, we the body. Perhaps they both were right. But many gave other reasons for these things, and all of them were gravely discussed. But curiously enough, the two who gave the reasons I have told were laughed at and told that such things could not be. So they said little about their thoughts, because, like all those who are sure that they know the truth, they could afford to wait until their words were proved to be right. 6. At first Aileen longed to tell the world of better things. She would gladly have told the world of the glorious masonry of those noble cities which she saw in her visions, cities where men and women moved like gods, where sorrow and want and selfishness seemed to be unknown. She longed to tell them of the harmonies which came to her of music which might stir a dead world to life, thrilling all nature into blossoms and fruits in abundance, as the music of a waterfall seems to send life into the flowers which grow beside. She would have told them of the colors with which nature loves to paint the sky, the mountains and valleys, sea and land, when all is ready for the master's work. For nature paints wherever the canvas is prepared to receive the picture, and she asks no price for her work. Aline knew of times in the past, times that will come again, when man did not ever strive to be rich regardless of his poorer brothers, but each worked as he was able all working for the whole world's good. And she would have told them how in those times man did not earn his living by toil unending, by ceaseless pain and sorrow, but that nature helped him as he helped her, and the earth brought out her stores of rich fruits for the welfare of her upgrown sons, well knowing that they in turn with loving service would seek to make nobler and better that which nature gave to them in charge birds and beasts, flowers and trees, plants and stones and all that lives, which is everything. Aline saw how the desire to possess more than enough for the selfish pleasures of saying, is mine, how the growth of selfishness in the world, the love of killing nature's younger sons for food and pleasure increased, how the love of ease and forgetfulness of others and of duty to mother nature how all these things had chilled the warmth of the one great life that is in all things, and crippled the mother's efforts to help her wayward sons. Others had told these things. Others had striven to show the glorious light of life that shines behind the cold mist of sin and sorrow which has been cast like a veil over the earth. But all had been rejected. Some were ill-received. Some were stoned. Some were killed. How can I raise this humanity which, like a great orphan, has cut itself off from its mother, and now lies ignorant of the happiness that awaits its coming? thought Eline. I have returned to tell them of the way, and they will not hear. Others have returned as far as they might and have been rejected. Others still have boldly plunged deeper yet in the hot sea of human life and been lost in its poisonous fumes. Even so, I will again return, yet lower if by chance there be a few who will not reject my message. 7. So Aileen hid in her heart the things she knew and the things she would have told, 
as she had hidden in her soul at the river of forgetfulness the memory of the king's garden of delight. And she took her way into the world with messages of love and of hope, such simple messages as the children understood, better sometimes than their elders. She told the children many beautiful fairy stories, and they listened eagerly. They did not know that these were the stories which she had told to the learned ones of earth, and which were really true, though they had not believed. The children listened, and they said, It is beautiful. Some day we will seek out such a beautiful world as that of which the stories tell. There were houses, too, which they built, little toy houses with toy bricks. But Aileen showed them how to shape the bricks and how to make each brick fit in its proper place, so that never a one should lose its worth. And Aileen showed the children how that behind the building of beautiful mansions there was the beautiful thought that made the masonry so noble a work though it were only toy masonry, and the children understood. In their games they had done each his best, and they did well. But Aileen showed them games in which they all acted together, even the little ones helping and sharing. It was wonderful to them that they had not thought of this before, because now they found that they could do more than ever they had done when each worked alone and for himself. Near the city where they dwelt was a vast plain full of great boulders, which they could have made into a great park and a beautiful garden, but the people of the city cared not for such things and would not help them. By themselves they knew not how to move the rocks, so it remained a waste of wild growth, except in those places where the children had moved, one by one, and with great difficulty, the smaller stones. Now Aileen bid them take a strong rope, for, said she, we will clear that plain, and it shall be for a dwelling and a garden for all. She was thinking of the king's garden. The children looked at her in astonishment, as though they wondered if she meant the thing she said. We have no rope, they said, and none will give us any. There is your rope, said Aileen, pointing out the overgrown plain, where, amid the rocks, in the great patches from which they had slowly and painfully drawn the smaller stones, grew masses of pale blue flowers, beautiful, delicate little blossoms, like wind flowers. Again the children looked at her, questioningly, not as the people at first had done, but trustingly, though they knew not what she would have them do, but sought to learn her wishes. So at her bidding they gathered all the ripened stalks of the little flowers and laid them out in the sun as she directed. Almost it seemed a pity to destroy the plants. One little worker asked Aileen of this matter, for he loved the flowers and was sorry to see them gathered and dried. "'Does it not hurt the flowers to pluck them?' he asked. "'Some say that you can talk with them as with all living things, and you can tell if the flowers do not suffer in the gathering, although they are old and ripe.' His was a loving heart, and Aileen saw that he asked this out of no mere curiosity. Gently she touched his forehead with her finger. Look, she said, look and listen, for I have opened the seeing eye to you. 8. And the boy looked around in wonderment, amazed, and saw that the whole great plain was full of teeming life which he had not before seen. Fairies and elves peeped from every flower, gnomes and earthmen worked and played and danced among the boulders and where before was silence but for the rustling of the leaves in the breeze, there rose a murmur of many voices, like the humming of bees in the sunshine. The boy listened, and at once he knew what the flowers were whispering. There is a saying that the flax people are being used for a mighty work, said one little blue fairy to another. I heard a bee spreading the news, said another. All the flax people are asked to give their dresses to help in clearing the plain for a palace and a garden where the kings may dwell. Not kings of earth and of little cities, but kings of wisdom whom nature loves to obey, and we among her children. Body after body have I grown, said the other. I have struggled and striven to grow useful in this glorious brotherhood of nature, and my only success seems to be that I have a pretty head. It is good to be beautiful, perhaps. But I have always thought that I would sacrifice my beauty for a chance of sharing in noble deeds. 
The butterfly that had stopped to listen now spoke to her. You have waited, and now you will have your reward, for surely your body will be taken to help in the work that is going forward. The flax people have indeed lived to good purpose. They certainly do not seem afraid to die, said the boy to himself. And as if in answer to his whispered thought, the little flax fairy said, Of course we are not afraid. I have been told that there are giants of men who really think that when they leave their worn-out stalks, bodies they call them, behind they live no more, or at least are not sure what becomes of themselves. But it cannot be true. It must be a fairy story, laughed the little elf. They must know, as we know, that all things sleep a while and then take new bodies like dresses woven while they worked in their last awaking which men call life. And then one day we know that we shall have woven dresses so fine that we shall be free to leave them as the butterfly leaves his dull-hued robes and spreads his bright wings for flight into the grand unknown which we all long to know. But how do you know that these things are so? asked the boy. How do I know that I am alive? answered the flax fairy in a murmur. Fainter grew the voices, and the vision faded from the boy's sight. He knew not how long it was he stayed there, but after a while he awoke with a start to find that Aileen was no longer with him, and that he had slept among the flax in the sunshine. 9. It must have been a dream, he said, but he did not believe it was a dream, for all his words. And really the flowers seemed to him to bear a new life after that wonderful vision which came to him when Eline gave him for an hour the seeing eye. Working with the others joyfully and happily without a moment's pause or one thought of failure, they saw quickly growing an immense heap of beautiful fine white thread. The children had helped the flax to grow, and now, in turn, it aided them to clear more ground. For in no long time all was finished, and before them they had a mighty rope growing greater every day under their leader's eye. One strange thing there was about the rope, for there were golden threads interwoven which the children did not remember having seen among the flax, and they wondered. But Aileen only said, it is golden flax. Whatever it was, it shone brightly in the sun until it looked like a ray of real sunlight in the rope. One little child said, It looks like a brother to the sun. Perhaps it is, said Aileen, and smiled. The work grew apace, and the play grew apace, because the children scarcely knew which was work and which was play. They seem to have found something better than both. Stone after stone, rock after rock, was encircled with the cord and triumphantly drawn by that merry army of children to the edge of the plain. Clearer and clearer grew the space, where before the stones had been little pools of water formed, while round them grew masses of beautiful flowers, among which was a new crop of the little blue flax, stronger and better grown than any that had been there before. Gradually there grew up a great wall of rock around the plain where the boulders were drawn by the children, for each was taken to its nearest boundary, as Aileen told them this would be the simplest way to clear the plain. Some mighty rocks yet remained in the center of the plain, but the children had so seen the wisdom of their leader that they doubted not that these two would be removed without difficulty, although how this was to be done they could not tell. And as the work was nearing an end, they did as their leader bid them in perfect trust. Actually, they put their ropes around a rock which some said was like a small mountain. They pulled with a will, but the rock moved not. Still they pulled, willingly and with all their might, for now they had grown strong until they scarcely knew their own powers. From the great city, from the mountains, and from the country round about, came sightseers and inquirers. At first they only laughed and talked and helped not at all. But among them came men of strange countenance, strong men, wise in looks, men of kingly bearing. These said, It is not right that these children should work forever alone. 
and they too, with strong grip of a strange sort, laid hold of the golden ropes, seeing which the idlers too came and helped until with a mighty song of joy the children saw the great rock move, slowly at first, then faster, faster, until with a run they had placed it in a far corner of the great plain, standing like a sentinel to the north. 10. Another and yet others followed. East and south and west, the unhewn boulders stood like guardians of the plain. A circle of twelve yet remained in the center like giant pillars supporting the sky. But these, Aileen said, should stand, as also some smaller ones which were placed across their tops like great beams resting upon a doorway. How this was done I cannot say. But there is a saying in the city that, in the night before they were found placed high above the giant circle, the sound of a great and joyous song, a hymn of power, was heard like the tones of a great bell shaking the houses with its vibrations, and putting men in fear of the destruction of their city. But at sunset the children had not returned from the plain, so that they were not in the city when this happened. And not until the sunrise did the people flock to the doors and windows for a glimpse of the joyous army that marched in their streets. Led by the men of kingly bearing, the children marched, singing a song of triumph, with such shining glory in their faces that all the people marveled. Tired they were, and slept. But when in the late noontide the people asked them what had happened, all seemed like the forgotten glory of a dream. They could remember little except that they were filled with the joy of wonderful things which no tongue could tell. The work had not taken one day, or two, but many days. Months and even years had passed since the children played together in the sunshine. Strong and sturdy lads and lasses were they now. A beautiful temple had arisen within the giant circle, and all around it was a garden of beauty like no garden which they had seen. But when Eileen looked amid the rare flowers and found a little purple star with heart of gold, she knew that it was a flower from the king's garden, and she was glad that it could grow where all was rock before. There were great purple pansies, too, like thoughts from the palace in which Eileen had lived. Now it was that the children came to the temple to learn of Eileen, and she taught them the wonderful truths which she knew. To them she told the wonderful things that have been, and the more wonderful things that may be, if men will only try to bring them about. She taught them things so simple that they often wondered why they had not already known them without the telling. They did not know that there was a good reason why it should be so. Aileen taught them, too, how by all working together for the welfare and progress of all, there is no task we may not overcome. We know it, said the children, remembering the waste of rocks in the plain where now the garden stood and the temple. Each by himself can do much, but all working together can move the world, she said. Now I will tell you a strange thing, which is yet true, for we are not at all separate from any other thing in the world, but the same nature is in us as in them in the rocks and the flowers, in the forests and streams, in city and mountain, in air and fire and water, just as the rocks and this temple are of the same stone, although they differ in shape. And if we only will, we can make all our rocks into beautiful, glorious temples. When the world of men has learned this lesson, the earth itself will become a mighty temple, that the wise teachers of old, whom men call gods, may come to us again and live with us in peace forevermore. And it shall be known that music is life. For in music is harmony, and by harmony all things live, each note in its own place, doing its perfect work, be it great or small. For this, too, is a brotherhood of harmony. Because in those days the people listened to the teachings from the temple and to the great ones who came to dwell therein when it was finished, and who taught the seekers after truth through their messenger Aileen, there were happiness and joy and peace in all the land. Men became nobler as they thought of nobler things than had hitherto been their custom. 
seeing the beauty of the temple and the mighty work that comes of aiding nature working in unity and harmony they also built their houses to be like the temple stone they used for brick beautiful they built them within and without and they labored to make their dwellings fit temples for the gods for it was said among them that sometimes strangers would visit their city and seeking entrance would dwell with them a while where they found a welcome and it was noticed that always they came to such dwellings as those where the beauty and harmony of the building showed beauty and harmony within and when they left the house there always seemed to remain a memory of their presence as a ray of light at sunset leaves a memory of joyous days and a sense of hope for brighter days yet to come when this thing happened the neighbors would gather together and it was said the master has built the house then the great beam which rested on the pillars of the doors was lifted and where it had stood was built an arch of stone and last of all was dropped in place the keystone which held the arch and there was great rejoicing for the people said the house is finished some there were who would have lifted the beam and built the arch but unless the master had been in the house always some accident would occur and the house be destroyed in the center of the arch was placed a great light which was ever kept burning for it was fed with oil of gold which never burns away but whose smoke ever turns to oil again each light was like the greater light which ever shone from the dome of the temple a light to lighten all around such light as it was said went out to the world from the temple itself in the knowledge of the laws of life and of all things good and great and beautiful never was the light to be put out lest harm should come day and night it was held a sacred duty to guard the light when that light shone there was peace and plenty in the land for fellowship made life joyful some called that glorious time the golden age some there are even now among us who will bring that golden age again to earth as then through brotherhood and the joy of life that misery shall not always be among us nor poverty sorrow and pain eleven but there came a day when messengers from far off lands came over sea a great journey to the temple and to Aileen they told the despair and want and the madness of unbrotherliness that men knew in the countries whence they came, countries where the light shone no longer. Of wars and of famines they spoke, of poverty, oppression, and crime. Aileen's great compassion could not be silent to appeal. From these things I say humanity shall be saved, said she. I have a duty here, but there are guardians in the temple and the call comes loud to me from the world beyond. I will go. Those messengers heard with joy of the success of their journey, for they had traveled far, and had overcome many trials and difficulties by the way. And all the time they had hoped in perfect faith that they would return with some encouragement to the country whence they came. And doubtless it was because of the grand faith they showed that Aileen herself answered their call. Guard well the temple while I am away, Aileen charged her people. I must travel far, but in no time I will return. I will return. Be watchful, therefore, that the light be burning, that the oil fade not. None can tell the time of the coming, whether it be by night or day. With your lives must you guard the light. She spoke somewhat sadly, as it seemed to them, and they supposed she thought of the great misery and need of those she went to succor in their distress. And they answered the more eagerly, We will, we will. For the first time since it had been built, the temple was left without its head, a sacred trust indeed. They thought they knew themselves. They thought they knew the evil in their natures and the good, did those temple watchers and in their surety of knowing they grew careless, so that in no long time they lost their caution. Some there were who were faithless, and these began to tell them of their great success, how they had built the temple, how their industry and labor had succeeded, how well they had learned to know themselves. Gently they suggested these things, gently these sayings took root, almost unperceived. Our temple which we have built is very mighty, 
It can never fail, they said. Some few there were who would have spoken for Aileen, but they were timid and afraid of those who talked so boastfully. Wherefore they were silent. It is true that one or two attempted to recall the noble deeds of the absent one, and to point out that she had really built the temple. They had supplied only the labor, yet the fruits of it were theirs and the world's. True, said the wicked and faithless ones, she had a great mind for building, but she made mistakes. She herself said so. We have learned by those mistakes, and we know. She would have made the temple's teachings too common altogether. Why, she actually began to turn into a teacher of virtues of which the world is weary, instead of building as at first. She had taught all she knew, but we can teach greater things and better things. We can teach the world twenty different styles of building in metals, wood, stone, and marble, of ornaments and decorations enough to last for a century. Thus we honor her, thus we carry on her work and make it grow, although she made mistakes. Indeed, she did make mistakes, said one, and the greatest mistake of all was when she chose such faithless craftsmen for the temple work. Shame on you! O oh, faithful one, said they, such faith deserves a great reward. To you we will entrust the duty of finding her. We will give you all you need for the voyage, a ship and provisions enough for a year. 12. So those treacherous ones cast adrift on the ocean the one who remained faithful, and those others who would have spoken out for their absent teacher were silenced against their own better natures. For those wicked ones had been great among them, and they were afraid. It was thought that in no long time the winds and waves would destroy the little ship with its lonely voyager. Yet with stout heart, knowing that he might not return alone, he held on fearless and determined. Sometimes it seems that those who so follow the voice of their inner wisdom in dauntless courage are helped by nature, as though she ever loved such brave hearts. I have heard the story told how the great Columbus who found a new world was beset by his followers to return. How nature sent him messages that he was nearing land.